Um, hello, everybody. Um, I think that we should be live now. We're just going to give everybody two minutes or so to actually join the session. Um, so in that time, if you have um, uh, the time, could you please just maybe introduce yourself in the chat so that um, people can start to see who you are, which university you work or study at, and what kind of career stage um, you're at at the moment. So for example, um, I'm Lucy Morgan and I'm going to be chairing this session today and facilitating the, um, the panel session that we've got going on a little bit later. And I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University and I've been doing that for about two years now. Um, and I'm also on the OR Society research panel. So we'll just give people another minute uh, to actually come along and whilst we're doing that, please do introduce yourselves because one of the reasons we're doing this um, kind of network event is so you can get to know each other a little bit as well or the idea behind the network is so you can get to know each other. Okay all right so I will get started because we are in a bit of a tight schedule we've got lots of things going on for you today um, so the first thing I want to say is welcome to our um, early career researcher event um, this is not just an event for the OR Society annual conference this is the launch of an actual network that we're putting together for you all. Um, so as I said before, I'm going to be chairing and facilitating this event. And I'm joined today by Carol who, um, McLaughlin from the OR Society, who has helped me organise all of this. And also Eve from the OR Society. So Carol and Eve are going to be there on the chat if you have any problems or you experience any problems with this event. So do make sure that if you've got any um, questions or problems that you, you, you do put them in the chat. Okay. Cool. So what we've got coming up for you today, um, I'm basically going to start off, you're going to hear from me for about the next 10 minutes about what the ECR network is, and then we're going to get into the interesting stuff. So we've first got um, um, two kind of talks around the theme of um, grant um, writing and grant applications uh, from two different perspectives, really. So we've got um, a talk from Belen Martin Barrigan from the University of Edinburgh looking at the perspective of somebody who's actually gone through the process of applying for and um, actually successfully winning the grant, um, some grant money um, and what it was like for her to lead her first project. And then we're going to go through um, to um, Mark and Laura, so from EPSERC and ESRC respectively, um, and they're going to talk to you about kind of the details of what kind of funding's out there at the moment and how you might apply for that. So that's more on the details of what the grant application process is like, rather than what it would be like if you actually had the grant or how to get the research idea. And then finally, we're going to go through a panel session and um, we've got some really great panel members um, here for you today. Um, and they're going to be talking to us and answering the questions that you sent through um, in the registration form. But there are opportunities to actually send in more questions today as we go on as well. So a little disclaimer, this is actually my first webinar um, and my first time sharing anything. So if the transitions are a little bit ropey, then do just bear with us. We're just doing our best, okay? Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping for you all. Um, we recommend that if you have um, the speaker showing at all, then you have them at the top right hand corner because then you can basically see everything that's on the slides. Um, and then we're anticipating that you'll have more questions that come up during the sessions than you actually do now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the how to actually get those questions answered. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's um, a little um, button available that says Q&A on it. And um, in there, that's the Zoom Q&A feature. So if you haven't used it before, that's where you can put questions that you think of during any of the talks or the panel session today. Um, if you see a question that you think is particularly good, you can upvote that question and we will try and cover the most upvoted questions during the session. Um, we want to ask you to keep questions that you put in the question and answer facility about the actual talks or the panel session that's going on at the moment. Um, if you have anything else that you want to ask, for example, if you want to ask about the ECR network, the OR society, or if you're having a technical problem, then please do post that in the chat instead. And Carol and Eve will be trying to look at that to keep um, any of those questions answered. But Q&A for talks and for the panel session, do feel free to drop them into um, our Q&A box. And then I'll try and ask as many as possible. 
Um, if you've got a, during the panel session a question for a specific panelist, do let us know. We can direct it towards them. And then after each of our each of the different talks, we're actually going to clear the box so that I can actually see which questions for which talk or which panel. And um, so they will disappear out of the Q and A box. But don't worry, they're not actually gone. They're there for us to actually try and answer afterwards. So anything that we haven't answered during the um, this session, during the panel session or otherwise. Don't worry, we're still gonna try and get those answered and keep an eye out on the LinkedIn group, the ECR network LinkedIn group um, for a little bit more on any of those. So I'll try and do that in the next few days. So yeah. Oh, and there's also as usual in um, these Zoom meetings, you can raise your hand, but we'd ask you not to do so. So if you've got a question, please do try and not to raise your hand about it and just use the Q and A feature. Um, or the chat feature if it's a problem with your um, with the actual uh, running of the session. Okay, so on to the fun bit. So I want to welcome you to the ECR network. You might be wondering why we're trying to set this up at the moment. Um, the actual origins of the idea for this network came from um, a previous event that we had two years ago, um, which I attended as just a, a delegate, not as any kind of organiser or anything like that. So that was the ECR workshop in 2018 and that ran um, kind of just before OR60. So I know some of you that are in the audience today that have registered have actually, you actually came along to that as well. And at that session, um, we did some really fun activities, but we also did some discussion on what could be done for ECRs. And one of the ideas behind that was, well, um, can we have some kind of network where we can support each other or there's some information passed out uh, through the network or somewhere for ECRs to go to ask questions, things like that. So the idea behind the network basically comes from that discussion and that like kind of outcall for the need for something for, for somewhere for ECRs to go. And I think if anything, this year, whilst we're all kind of in lockdown and away from um, kind of our departments, and kind of like working on our own a little bit more, the need for that kind of network and peer support is even greater. So I hope that we can get some good engagement in the network. And if you um, do have a, a question or a problem that you feel able be, to ask that in this network. Okay, so the idea behind it is that we will actually, as ECRs, run this network. So it's gonna be, an a network for ECRs run by ECRs. So that's not just me. I'm hoping that other people will want to join me in um, kind of helping to maintain and grow this network as we go along. So at the, at the bottom of this slide, I've basically got a, a little message there. So if you are interested in, do join us on LinkedIn anyway, but if you want to help maintain or get involved in the organization of this network, then contact me or Carol at the OR Society. Okay, so as you can see here, we've got, um, the, what I've got on the slide is um, like just the, the header from our um, uh, LinkedIn group. So you can go, that's what the LinkedIn group is called. So you can find that on um, LinkedIn now if you want to and join the group or um, in the OR Society or the OR Annual Conference um, kind of um, organization guide, you'll see links to the LinkedIn group there where you can click through and just ask to join. Um, some of the aims of the network are, well, the main two aims are peer support and trying to disseminate information. So my first aim would be the peer support kind of side of things. We want you to be able to kind of get your answers, uh, questions answered on things that are important to ECRs. But on top of that, we also want to kind of celebrate ECR accomplishments as well. So we want the network or the LinkedIn group or Twitter or beyond to actually be a place where you can kind of say, oh, I've published a paper, I want to tell people about it, things like that. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about how to get involved in that on the next slide. And the second um, aim of the network is um, trying to give out information on ECR appropriate events. So I'm not just talking about OR Society affiliated events. These are just general training events and workshops um, or anything else that we see that comes up um, that we think might be ECR appropriate. So we'll be posting those on the LinkedIn group so that everybody gets to learn about them. And then there's the opportunity to get training that you might not have known about. So for example, um, recently, um, Carol shared with me um, 
a course that came up from the UK government about learning how to interact with Parliament. Um, unfortunately, when I went to look at that uh, course, the positions for the, the, it was all full, so I couldn't actually post that on the group, but they're the kind of things that we would be trying to kind of get out there um, to you so that you can actually, you know, do more training if you want or come up with some nice um, kind of join some workshops if appropriate. Okay. So a little bit more on how you can get involved. Um, so after this event, um, we're going to send out a survey to you all. Um, and we want to find out what you want from the ECR network as an ECR yourself. And we also want to find out that after this event, if you've enjoyed it, what you might want to see at future ECR events. So as I've said, we're theming today a little bit on the grant application side. Maybe the next event could be on something like, um, I don't know, balancing teaching versus research or something like that. So do let us know what you think would be useful for you and we will guide the next event from there. Um, we also think that it would be nice um, if you could get involved in some other ways. So sharing your success with um, the community, if you've done something particularly um, some particularly exciting work or you've won an award, please do feel free to share that with us and we can set up a dedicated post to that. Um, and we're hoping as well to in the future come do something on like have a monthly featured ECR where we talk about have an ECR that basically presents their work, whether that be in a post or maybe in a in the form of a talk or something like that. So we're just kind of hoping that these kind of um, events will bring us all together so you get to know each other a little better as well as um, getting something from um, getting your questions answered from the network. Okay. So um, last thing I'd want to say is that our LinkedIn group is for everybody involved in the LinkedIn group. So if you want to post something on there, whether you have a question or you um, can see a question that you know the answer to, that you can help support someone else, then please do post. Uh, don't be shy. The more engaged you're going to get in the actual network, the better it will be. If it's just me replying to everything, I, I think it'll be, um, I don't know, I don't have that many interesting things to say. So uh, please do get involved and um, if you see or want to question anything, then do. Um, we don't currently have a Twitter, but some things that we send out through the OR Society Research Twitter channel um, will be ECR um, appropriate. So if you like Twitter and that's something you do, then do follow at ORS underscore res because that's the OR Society Research and the events that we post on our um, LinkedIn group will also put up on there. We'll try and make sure that you know that they are um, kind of ECR appropriate. Okay, so just the last word that I want to say um, before I hand over to Belen for the first talk is um, we're lucky actually enough to have been sponsored by Invenia Labs today and we have um, Joshua Knowles in the audience from them. Um, if you don't have not heard of them before, they're basically a team of scientists with a diverse backgrounds, but mostly numerical things like machine learning, theoretical physics, etc. And um, their aim is to use machine learning uh, techniques to solve real world problems. I hope I've got that okay, Joshua. Um, and he is happy for you basically to contact him um, after this session. If you've got any questions about Invenia Labs, uh, maybe job opportunities there, or potentially balancing that academic career with an industrial one, because it seems like there's a good balance um, at that company. Okay, right, so at this stage, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to get um, Belling to put her slides up. Um, so just whilst that transfer happens, um, I think uh, I'm just going to introduce Belling quite quickly. Um, sorry about this. I don't know if, I don't actually know what you're seeing at the moment. Uh, I think, yeah, there we go. She's actually started to share a screen now. Sorry about that. The transition is really difficult. Okay, so I'd like to now introduce um, Belling Martin Barrigan, who's going to tell you about her experience, um, her first experience of being a PI on a, a grant project. Um, so Belling's a, a reader in management science at the University of Edinburgh, and um, she basically does works on the interface of optimization and data science. So over to you, Belling. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Lucy. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting uh, inviting me to this uh, talk because it's something that I, I feel very excited about. So um, 
Uh, this is a bit about me, but uh, I think I'm going to focus mainly on the tips for kind of like for you, which is the important part. And uh, as you can see here, I've been involved in uh, several grant applications even before getting my first grant, my EPSRC grant. And I basically what I want to say here is that I recommend you that you get involved early. Uh, some of them were unsuccessful and some of them I just like help some friends. Some of them were with my former mentors as a principal investigator. But uh, overall, what I feel is that during my career from very early on, I was learning a lot from those opportunities. And another um, thing that I've uh, done, and I think it helps a lot to learn how to write grant, good grants, is to evaluate, to be uh, an evaluator. So every opportunity you have for kind of like um, volunteering or for kind of like letting your supervisor or your mentors know that you are willing to do this job. This is very nice because it's paid, which is very different from um, um, reviewing papers. And although it's not like you do it for money, but I think it's kind of like a nice thing, especially when in your career you start having like the kids and you know, like you have so much pressure on, you know, time. And it's like, so this little money it helps you like at least uh, your mindset, but it's going to have, you know, another part of your, of your house, you know, it's like you're not taking time from your children for nothing. So, but, but the main thing is that you're going to learn a lot with that. So I've done it several times for, for Spain and for the European Research Council. You can volunteer yourself. So there is a, a link where you, you, maybe not always, but there are calls where you can volunteer yourself. And that's very good. So I recommend you to do that. Uh, then why to apply for, for grants? That's a very, very important question. And the main thing is money. But money is not really money in the sense that it's money for you. But it's very important because you get resources, which in, in the case of our field is mainly time and work. And this is very important when you start advancing in your career. At the beginning, when you are a PhD student, you love doing all the different parts of the job. You, you, you love the, like crunching the problem, but also you love like sitting there and coding and then doing the experiments. And, but when you, your career advances, you have more so the ideas for crunching the problem uh, and, and the ideas for kind of, uh, they, they are much more than you can really like do. And also you have less time because you have other responsibilities, responsibilities like for example, teaching or administrative responsibilities. So, so there is a lack of, of time. And this way you can either buy yourself time or uh, hire other people doing that. And then another thing is that when you hire other people, it's like you're changing, moving from mm, your position already. So you are already developing and also uh, participating or being a leader. Okay, so you are starting to be a leader. And this is very important also on your, on your career. You're moving from the person doing that to the person that makes the thing go and make the thing happen. And, and, and your ideas, it's, it's easier to, to kind of implement more ideas when you have the the work and the resources for those doing that. And then another thing is the pre prestige. Prestige is something that, that is very important because you, you get uh, for promotion is important and also because you, you are a bit more visible. So um, the EPSRC grant, especially this, it used to be called first grant. Now it changed the name, but there is one very similar. And this, uh, these are recognized as, you know, something that if you're young and you get it, it's because somehow, you know, your, the work you're doing is important. So it's recognized and this is good for your career. And then another thing, which is like uh, the writing itself, it gives you time for thinking, stop and think. And this is very important because you, when you are working in a paper, you know all the ins, uh, ins and outs, you, are, you, you know all the details, and you are so much in the, to the details that it's very easy to kind of like become, uh, to get new questions and new answers or new improvements of that methodology. Of, but uh, there, they start being little steps there, and you need this time for stopping and getting a, a step backwards 
and then looking at the big picture. Okay, which is the big problem I want to solve, and how is this helping me to solve that problem? How, what is the best way to contribute to that problem? And, and, and this is very, very nice to do. And even if you don't get the grant, what is nice about that is that this time of thinking is good for your research. So the next thing, the next paper that you're gonna do, it has more value because you have this time of stopping and thinking, I don't want just to improve this in an epsilon. You want to improve it much more because you are looking for uh, solving a bigger problem. Then another question that I get very often, or I, I, I also, uh, when I think backwards is something that I, is when to apply. And my advice is that you do it as soon as possible. You start already thinking about what would you like to do and, you know, and, and, and to search for grants, um, calls, and, and then thinking about, about it and start doing it. Uh, there are situations when you want to be strategic, like for example, for this EPSRC first grant that I got, and now it has a different name. This one, so, um, for this one, you, uh, it's important maybe that you, you wait because you can only do it once. So maybe it's better to do it, you know, like at the end of the period when you are still eligible, so you can have more papers. Or sometimes maybe you have a minor revision in a top journal, then you wait until that's kind of really approved and then you can you apply so you can leverage and you, you have more, more chances to get in it. Uh, but in general, don't, don't wait too much. Try to, to get involved as soon as possible, if not as a principal investigator, try to, to get involved in different stages, not only with your supervisors, but with other colleagues that are more or less at the same stage, because you are going to learn a lot about that. Another um, thing that you have to take into account is like leveraging your main pub publication. So basically, like um, your research, the research, the research career is not stable. So the publication, sometimes you work a lot, you put a lot of effort, but then it's like nothing is happening. The publications are not, are not going out. And then for a period, it's like they start, you know, the effort that you made maybe three years ago, it's now there, you know, it's like you're not putting that much effort or you're putting the effort in other parts of your career, but the publications are, are coming because you put the effort time ago. So sometimes they, they kind of cluster together. So this is what I mean by leverage your main publication. So don't think that, you know, at any moment is going to be the same because there are moments in your career when, you know, like it looks like you did a lot and maybe this effort, it was continuous and it was at another moment, but it's there. So try to take advantage of that. And then this thing about the moment is now what I, I want to say is like, if you start thinking like now is not a good moment because I'm it's very busy, I have to Teaching, I'm going to move um, soon, or I just moved, and uh, then you're going to miss opportunities. And this is a pity. So don't think about that. And another thing is like I put here the maternity leaves or pregnancies or these kind of things. Don't let one thing stop the other, okay? So just go for the ground or go on with your career. And then if you get pregnant and you need, then there are ways to come around this and, and solve the issues that you're going to have, okay? So think about, you know, that and, and the same, the opposite is also true, like if you're thinking of getting pregnant or something, go, you know, don't stop that because of your career and because of getting your ground, because, you know, it's like they work with them in, independently because then after you have the ground, it's going to be like more problem, more, so more work to do, not more problems, but more work to do, and other exciting things that are there to your whole uh, career. So, so now is so later is not going to be better than now. Just that's my my advice. Uh, then uh, another important thing is the idea. Okay, what are we going to um, apply for? What uh, what is the idea? And here, what I recommend you is that you. Take time, think about the big challenge you're gonna, you want to solve, okay? And of course, like we, then you're not gonna solve like the 
all the problems in the in, of the world now with your rand so you have also taken into account what is feasible to do with your knowledge and with your abilities and your skills and with the current state of the art so at the end in science we, we advance with a lot of baby steps or small steps okay but it's important to keep in into your mind and, and to understand what is the, the big problems that you are you want to solve with your grant and then the the important thing in the grant and the thing I, I recommend you to to do is try to 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 link it to link the both things the 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 big problem the world challenge and the achievable goal what you think is your contribution is going to be and spend them very uh, clearly and the relation between the the, the, the journey between the two um, and then when you're writing the grant it's very important so the this word challenge it's more important in the grant i think than the achievable goal because you you need to show why this grant should be funded why a money that is public that is coming from the taxes of all of us needs to be put into into your grant in it. why is because you want to solve something that is useful for all of us and of course a small step in that is do, would be what you're going to do in the grant but you have to convince people first that it's worth putting the money there so it's very for me the i think the the goal challenge is what do you want to solve with this grant is the the main idea and of course you have also to show the journey it's not enough in saying that you have to show how you're going to do that and in that you have to bring your expertise and then one thing that is really important, uh, and, and, and this is also in why it is important to, to, to explain and focus on the world challenge is because the, the evaluators, they are not always in the experts. They are not always in our areas. Sometimes, for example, in the European grants, they are from different, very different areas sometimes. And even if you go for the EPSRC grant, mathematics of OR uh, is part of you know, sometimes you get uh, into a panel that is in mathematics, for example. There are hard people from algebra, from, you know, other fields. And they are intelligent people. They are going to be able to understand the ideas, but still, you, you cannot talk with the, with the jargon of our um, uh, field. So I, I put, in this sense, it's what, uh, my recommendation is that you focus mainly in this uh, world challenge, in the big, big idea. And you write everything like for a five years old kid. So try to 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 write everything in a way that is understandable for them. But also you have to keep in your mind that the experts they are gonna read it. So you cannot put like stupid things. Okay. So you have to write it in a very like uh, layman la language that everyone is gonna be able to understand it. Um, but at the same time you have to explain the, the the key things you have to make sure the experts they, they they understand that what you are trying to do is interesting and is innovative okay one thing that you don't need with your uh, writing there is convincing the experts you are the expert for that or, or you are good or you know enough about the subject for that i think what you what they would do or i recommend is to use the bibliography so when you are writing the case of support, try to cite yourself a lot. This I've seen it most of the, the grants that I have evaluated and it looks very strange when someone doesn't do it because it's like, okay, mm, yeah, but how, how much do you know about this? Okay, so in this sense, you're not, you don't need to show uh, explicitly there that you know about the top, topic, but you are citing yourself, so you are the expert, you know about that. It's your way of showing it, okay? And, um, I put here some of the of the of the tweet Lloyd. So um, yeah, cite as much as you uh, have you um, have, or cite your best paper in a strategic way, and also relate those publications the best that you have uh, with the the current objectives or the method that you're gonna use in the grant. That's another key thing, and this again shows that you are the best for performing this grant for um, for this project. Okay, you are the best because is your methods that are gonna be used there, okay? Um, when citing others, 
think that this is not a paper, okay? And so uh, you sometimes, so you don't need to be comprehensive and cite everything. You need to show that the topic is important. Uh, this is very important. And for that, you can use academic papers, but also policies or news. And, and don't use many, but you just uh, need a couple of them, maybe, or three of them to show that the topic is important, okay? And uh, it's like you select the, the key ones, okay? So sometimes, for example, uh, you, you want to uh, cite one key classical uh, uh, result that you, you, you are going to uh, do something related to that, but only if it's really like that classic result, maybe many people they try to, to, to solve it or to, to use it in different ways, but you know, no one succeeded. So why do you think you're going to uh, succeed on that? You cite that one, okay? Because it's a key thing. Or maybe the news to show, show, to show that this problem is the, the big challenge that you're going to try to solve is important and is important now because it's in the news um, and this kind of things. And um, so this is, uh, here is an example. So in, some, in a part of my grant, I was talking about functional data analysis. And I, you know, there are many class, classic books about functional data analysis, but I didn't cite them. I, I, I went directly with, to the, the paper where I contributed to that. And, and this is not really like my area of expertise. I have just, at that moment, I had just one paper on that, but it's there, okay? And, um, and here, uh, there, is, there is another citation of my paper, but that's my recommendation because um, you don't have all the, the space. So, um, if you start citing, papers of the people, it's very, very easily you lack space for really telling what you need to tell to convince people that they need to give you the, the project, the grant. Okay, so the um, other key messages is like, uh, yeah, when you're writing, try to so solve, try to answer these four questions, like, why is it important? So for that, I could explain what's the big world challenge that I want, or I think I, I, I'm, so I'm aiming to, to solve or to contribute to, to solving that. And then also how, why is timely? Why is it now a good moment for doing that? Okay, is it because, uh, you know, it's been a big problem for, forever, but now a recent result has come out and I think I know how to use it to solve that big problem, or is it because it's a new problem that is appearing now? Whatever you need to show, why is now an, a, new, a good moment for that? Then what is your solution? So you have to basically explain what is the path between the, uh, the uh, small achievable goals that you, you, you can achieve now with your problem and the big uh, challenge. And also what is this contribution that you are making? So describe it. And, uh, one very nice thing here is try to link it to your previous publications and try to explain why this uh, uh, kind of like natural next step. But this idea of the natural next step is very different from saying it's just uh, another variant of what I've done in the past. It needs to be something different from what you have done in the past, but at the same time, it's kind of natural. And there are many ways of, you know, like doing that. It's, for example, a maybe. It's natural because now I'm going to link to all the publications that, that I have. Or maybe I'm going to link it to publications of other colleagues or some other people that have appeared very recently or things like that, okay? But you try to leverage what you have done in the past. Then another thing is why it is ambitious. Why, uh, what is the difficulty about that? Because otherwise it's like, okay, if, if it's very evident, why is not anyone else doing that, okay? So you have to show why it's not solved them. So maybe it's because these tools that you have created, these methods that you have created in your last papers have not been applied to that because basically you are the ones who created that one year ago, okay? <laughs> or maybe because that problem was ad addressed by people in different areas or in the same area in operational research, but in a different topic. So maybe, you know, it has not been addressed in, yet with genetic algorithms or another thing, okay? And also 
and another key thing, and this is very important, is how you or your team are the best for doing that. And I have a bit of an uh, imposter uh, syndrome. So the, the thing is that because I have this, uh, spon uh, I don't feel like very comfortable like mm, telling that I'm the best. I think what I do is I, I try to, to show that I'm the only one who can do that. Like for example, there are all other groups that can do this, but they are in USA, but in Europe, there is no, no one that has this combination of characteristics or this combination of knowledge that is useful for this um, project. Uh, another thing that you can do is like link it with other rele relevant disciplines, what you have worked before, you have done other applications, and then also um, potential collaborations. You, you can name some uh, potential collaborators that can help you to be unique for that, and you, you can allocate resources for that, for visiting them. Well, with COVID, maybe not for visiting, but I recommend you also to think about that. This is a bit of the, um, yeah, this is how to, then you need to kind of like do the work plan. And for that, don't be like, don't think that this is a plan that you're gonna be tied to. It's more about, you have to think uh, what, um, evaluators are thinking there is that it makes sense, okay? And that you you put a lot of effort in uh, thinking in, in a reasonable way. So this is what you have to, to show. Like, for example, I had uh, three main research objectives. So I had four modules. I divided the, the work in, th in four modules. And then each module may have one, two, or three work packages, okay? And each work package, the they, they have different parts like modeling, then optimization, evaluation, then writing up. Or things like that. You don't have, you don't have the optimization. Sometimes the modeling is a more automatic, not a work, working package. But it was very nice. And then I, I put everything in a in this kind of table that you can see there. Okay. And this table uh, it shows everything basically. <laughs> the, the the workshops and everything with different colors, and also the time that I, I, I the cost of work in the project, everything. Okay. And then the resources, it, it would match this plan, okay? Make that, because I've seen grants where it's like, it looked like they had four working packages and uh, or four modules, so it made sense, like one post for each, and then it's like they were asking for five or six, and didn't really like match that good plan, and it was kind of like a pity that they didn't match, try the, the, the resources to match the, the work plan in a kind of, in a way that makes sense. Then another thing is that impact is the, I am, what you need for uh, the, Applications, as part of the application, you need the pathway to impact. You need to write that part. It's a document that is needed. And my recommendation is that you start, you don't, don't create your uh, project and then think about the impact. But think about the impact as something that is embedded in your project. So think about the ways that, you know, you have the, uh, this big challenge that you want to solve or you aim to, to solve or contribute to that. Then you have the little steps, what your, your contribution is going to really be. And, and so try to, to think in advance what are ways of achieving the big um, goal. So not only creating the new methodologies and the, in the papers, but also in how you're going to uh, engage with the, with the industry or with the general public. Okay? So in, the, in order to do that, you have to think about who can benefit with, to your, from your project, and also what links you may have access to, and what links can help create that access if you don't have access to, to that. And uh, also um, try to consider also the impact you can do through teaching. Maybe you can create new courses, or you can contribute to certain master, or you can in the future think about creating a new master if there is not one in that topic. So, so that way you are also engaging with potential industry aspects in the future, because you are through your teaching, especially in, in MSCs. 
but also from my own undergrad. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just uh, the last one is uh, basically a summary of everything. So it's um, volunteer to review uh, um, the proposals, either formally or informally. And also do not wait for the best moment because it's better not to wait, just go for it in general. And then tell the, 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 the whole journey story from, you know, what is the big picture and the big challenge and how your contribution is gonna move the science towards to, to that big picture. Then write also for the non-experts and for the experts at, at, like at the same time, but focus mainly on the non-experts uh, with, a, you know, saying things that make sense for the experts. And then another big thing is that if you are not successful, recycle, look for other type opportunities. Okay, that's my, my other advice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Feling. Um, that was a really good presentation. Uh, sorry we had to kind of slow you down there at the end. Um, just looking at the Q&A here, I'm just gonna ask you one question because we do need to move on, but do know all to all, all our delegates that there are, will be, um, time to get more um, answers to these questions afterwards. Um, so our main question is, um, how long does it take relative to, you know, writing papers and things like that? How long does it take for you to write a grant application? Oh, mm, I, if I think about the time I spent on, on that grant, it was much less than a paper, but the time for thinking, it was much more. But the good thing is that you can think in any moment, like, <laughs> you know, like of the day. So, so that's my experience. But that's, uh, it's also true that uh, since I got back um, from maternity leave like one year ago, uh, I've been involved in others and they are eating my time. Like, but they are a different kind of grant. Because they are also with industry partners and I kind of like, you know, like having the meetings with them and everything. Uh, but so so I think it's, for me it's quicker writing a proposal than a paper, and also in the paper you have the time of writing the paper and also the experiments and all those things. So yes, <laughs> much is. thank you. All right. One thing I'm going to take away from your talk today is the whole stopping and thinking because I don't think we take enough time to do that as academics. Okay, right. So thank you very much again, Belling, and I'm now going to hand over to Mark Jenkinson from EPSERC. Um, so Mark and Laura are going to be able, available to um, answer your questions after this um, talk as well. So I'll go straight to Mark. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, just to start out by saying thanks to Lucy and thanks to the OR Society for inviting us along today to give this talk. Um, we're going to run through applying for a grant at EPSRC. I'm joined by my old colleague, Laura McDonald. Uh, McDonnell, who has uh, recently moved to ESRC, uh, but she's also here to answer any questions. Uh, so yeah, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Mark Jenkinson. I'm a portfolio manager in the mathematical sciences team. Um, I look after the maths analysis portfolio, uh, the maths, mathematical physics portfolio, and the operational research portfolio. Uh, Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? So some of you may recognise me, my previous role was statistics, applied probability and operational research for EPSRC. And now I work in data strategy for ESRC, so our paths are likely to cross again anyway. So I'm just here to support Mark as my knowledge of, of operational research goes back about three years and poor Mark's goes back about six months. So <laughs> there'll Less probably be a few months. tricky questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm relatively new to uh, EPSRC, so do bear with me. Uh, so the agenda for the, the talk this afternoon, uh, we're going to run through some of the funding options at EPSRC, uh, not all of them, but that information is available on the website, um, and the application process, what is actually going to happen to your proposal, uh, and hopefully you'll find some of the hints and tips in there useful uh, when you're writing your grant proposal, and hopefully you will answer any questions. So the three types of grant we're gonna focus on today are standard grants, which are kind of the bread and butter of what we do every day at EPSRC. Um, but you also might be eligible for a new investigator award. So we'll run through the information on that and also fellowships. So standard mode grants. 
They are kind of what they say on the tin. They are flexible, open funding. It's a flexible, open funding route which supports a wide range of research programs. So there's no fixed length and there's no fixed value. And um, we do get some very small standard mode grants coming in. So you might uh, apply through the standard mode grant scheme for an overseas travel grant, for example, and that might be a relatively small amount of money, but also we do get some very large standard mode grants in. Um, and there are no constraints on the type of research you can apply for with a standard mode grant. So relevant activities uh, funded via this route are your research projects, your overseas travel grants, uh, workshops, network grants, and often it will be a combination of those different things. But as I said, as early career researchers, you may be interested in applying for one of our new investigator awards. So this is funding aimed to kickstart an academic career. So you should be in your first lectureship position with no experience running a research group. Um, and you are not eligible to apply if you have already been awarded a grant above £100,000 in value, and that also includes PDRA time. And your application must be the first to EPSRC as a PI. So that's except for postdoc fellowships, unsuccessful early career fellowships, or travel grants. Sorry, Mark, can I just jump in and say, yep. if you've been named on a grant, you can still apply for a new investigator award. If you've been a co-I on a grant, you can still do it. So if you're not sure, the best thing to do is to drop us an email. Like this is not an exclusive list of things that exclude or include you. So this is just the sort of things we get asked about most. Yeah, and that goes for uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, th this isn't a comprehensive list and uh, uh, my contact details are at the end of this presentation. So please do pick up the phone or drop us an email with any questions. Um, so justification of fit should be in the cover letter that you, this is suitable for a new investigator award. And, and as I say, refer borderline cases to the theme contact. Um, but there are some really good FAQs on the website that answer many of the questions you'll probably have. So thinking about the scope of a new investigator award, these are self-contained projects with a single research vision. Um, your objectives should be clearly defined, as should the outcomes, um, and perhaps more modest in scope than a standard mode grant. So we're going to get onto this further on in the presentation, but new investigator awards are considered in a separate list to the standard mode grants at our panel process. So the panel are aware that you are applying for a new investigator award and that you are probably earlier on in your academic career. Um, so travel impact activities and facilities need to be fully justified in terms of career development and results dissemination. A really important thing uh, as part of the new investigator award application process is the host organization statement. So this describes your university's commitment to developing your research career and it will also confirm your appointment details at that institution. And it's really important to get the new uh, the, to get the host organization statement right as an insufficient host support may jeopardize your application. So please do make sure that it provides everything that we need. So one last thing we're going to discuss today is fellowships. Uh, you may have heard that we are launching a new fellowship scheme at EPSLC. So the current fellowship scheme will end in December. Um, if you are hoping to apply for the old fellowship scheme, you must make sure that your application is with us by December 2020. Otherwise, you'll be applying to the new scheme. So the new scheme is a new and more flexible fellowship scheme. So we're moving towards open and open plus fellowships, as they will be known. And open fellowships offer a new vision which enables researchers to design a fellowship to fit their research ideas, their career stage, their development needs and leadership aspirations. And it will be open for all EPSRC remit areas, including multidisciplinary work. So we're trying to make them more accessible to you as researchers. 
but bearing in mind, even with the new scheme, it's always important to bear in mind that fellowships are personal awards for researchers, and we're looking to identify future leaders. So you're expected to demonstrate how you fulfill each of the expected attributes. So we're looking at research excellence, setting the research agenda, strategic vision, uh, profile and influence, that you're an inspirational team leader and that you want to develop your communication and engagement skills. So once you have your proposal, well, how do you actually submit the proposal? So when submitting a proposal, you'll have a cover letter. Uh, some, uh, I think a new investigator award, the cover letter is mandatory, but for a standard MO grant, it's optional. Um, and you will also have your proposal form where you can uh, summarize your research project. Uh, and then the case for support is the technical justification. And that's really a chance to uh, sell your research project. Um, a justification of resources will be required. Um, certain researchers and grants need to submit a CV, but that is not for all. Uh, proposals, so please check on the website. And for the new investigator awards, as I said, the host organization statement is really important. And any project partners need to be given a letter of support. So things to bear in mind, make sure you are eligible for the specific grant you are applying for. So seek out details from your colleagues at your institutions, your research office, and call us at EPSRC. As I said, I, I will give you my number at the end of this talk. Um, but there's really comprehensive funding guidance available on the website. Um, something that I'll pick up later on in this talk as well is that the reviewer forms, when you, you will submit your proposal to EPSRC and we will send it out into the academic community for reviews. When you're writing your proposal, you need to think about how is it going to be reviewed. And those reviewer forms are available for anyone to access on the website. So while you're writing your proposal, get those reviewer forms out and really think about what points you need to make. Now, I was having a conversation with Katie Blaney, who's the head of maths at EPSRC last week. And the main message she wants uh, you to take from this call is to seek out constructive criticism. So find colleagues who don't know your research and ask them to review the proposal before you submit it to us. Um, and by finding colleagues who don't know your research, they're less likely to paper over any holes in your proposal unconsciously. Um, so that's kind of the main message of today. And also remember any proposal is a pitch. So please try to communicate enthusiasm so how will it be assessed? The primary criteria is research quality. Uh, we then have the major secondary criteria, which is national importance. Uh, we're also going to consider the applicant's ability, well, peer review will consider the applicant's ability um, and resources and management. And also secondary criteria to new investigator awards is the host organization support and research independence and secondary criteria for fellowships. We are also looking at the research environment. So you've got your proposal together. Uh, what's actually going to happen to it? So this is the overview of the peer review process. So your proposal will come to me or the relevant portfolio manager at EPSRC, and I'm looking to send it out to reviewers. So you will be able to suggest some reviewers yourself uh, when you submit your proposal, and I will also be looking to get two more reviewers from the EPSRC Reviewer College. Now, Given, assuming that the, so the proposal will go out for review and we, I will get the reviews back in. Uh, given, assuming they, the reviews are supportive enough, um, they will then be returned to you and you will have the opportunity to give your PI response where you can address any concerns that have been raised by the reviewers. Uh, the PI response will then go with the reviews and the proposal to our peer review panel. A panel is made up of 12 um, academics uh, from across the mathematical sciences uh, spectrum. 
So it won't just be operational researchers, but it will be across all different areas of mathematical sciences. Um, and during the peer review panel, a rank ordered list will be produced for our theme lead, Katie Blaney, that's assuming it goes to a maths proposal. And uh, we will use our budget from the council to either fund or not fund proposals, depending on how far, uh, if, depending on where they appear on the rank ordered list. And as I said before, we produce two lists. So we will produce lists for standard mode grants, but also a list for new investigator awards. So the reviewers, your proposal will be assessed by three expert reviewers from the academic community against the assessment criteria. And as I said, those reviewer forms and the assessment criteria is on the EPSRC website. So please make yourself familiar with those when you are uh, putting your proposal together. Um, as an applicant, you will suggest three reviewers and uh, we will invite reviews from one of those uh, applicants as suggested reviewers. So as an applicant, who should you choose as an applicant reviewer? Um, it needs to be an expert in the field but not a collaborator, someone who you've collaborated with in the past or you currently collaborate with. And we do check the uh, reviewers against that. Uh, the reviewers must be at different institutions to where you are applying from and try to find someone who's likely to be familiar with the EPSRC process. And as I said before, I'll choose two more reviewers from the EPSRC Peer Review College. Now, when reviews come back, um, assuming they are supportive enough, I, uh, we will send the reviews back to you, the applicant, for you to give a PI response. Now, the PI response is one of the most important parts of the application process. So please make sure that you spend the appropriate amount of time uh, on your PI response. The panel really like to see a, a good detailed PI response. So what you should do, be factual and be specific. Back up any comments with facts, throw away your first attempt and rewrite it and agree to follow up suggestions from reviewers if they are appropriate. But please, what you shouldn't do is write nothing at all. We do get some PI responses that are blank. Um, Try not to criticize the reviewers. I know it's difficult. Someone's reviewed your proposal and they may have uh, raised some criticisms, but it's important that you just remember this is part of the process and don't criticize the reviewer, but instead address their, crit uh, their concerns. Don't ignore certain criticisms. So you should make sure that you address all of the points that are raised in the reviews and don't use uh, positive comments to counter negative ones um, and don't just repeat all the good points but remember your pi response it's not going back to the reviewers it's going to the panel along with the reviews so your audience is the panel and you're writing your pi response uh laura is there anything you want to add there are a few little things that i would just say but this is you know from long experience of doing this so Operational research is its own kettle of fish in terms of how it's funded and where it falls. And I know that all of you will have had at least one experience where you thought that you're an absolutely perfect remit fit for something and you've been rejected as out of remit or you'll all know someone in your department that has. So the first thing I'd like to point you towards is that we have a remit query service and I can put the link to that in the chat if you like. Um, you can use this to send a one pager of, I'm thinking of doing this, can you just point me in the right direction? So that's different councils or different parts of EPSRC. The other thing that I can't stress enough is that because your work tends to be really interdisciplinary or it can be quite unusual, we don't get that many applications. So for somebody seeing an operational research application for the first time, it can be a bit like, oh, what is this? Um, it's worth getting in touch with the portfolio manager for the area that you want to apply to. So we get a lot of operational research in engineering, we get it in um, in energy, we get a lot of operational research in maths and in ICT and in AI. So you've got a huge, you know, you've got lots of options there just within EPSRC before we move on to other councils. Find out who your potential portfolio manager is for the best fit. Drop them an email. They will be more than happy to help you. You know, we'd all much rather have things go to the right place, first of all. 
then have to email somebody back and say, oh, so you've gone through all this effort of sending this to me, but actually I think it's the wrong council or I think you've sent it to the wrong person. So open that dialogue early, make it easy for them to speak to you, make it really, really clear what, you, what you're going to do and they can help you get it to the right place. And you can use your cover letter to do this. So I know that Mark mentioned cover letters and said they're not always required. I would say for operational research, you should include a cover letter. And in that cover letter, you should say, I have submitted a remit query. I have spoken to so-and-so. So-and-so has agreed that this is, you know, it's in the right place. And just make it abundantly clear to anyone that picks up that proposal, so there's no discussion about it, that you've done all the things we've asked you to do, and it's now gone to the right home. And that will give you peace of mind, because there's also, I, I do a lot of community work, and I hear from people all the time, oh, you know, I sent it to Matt, and it got bounced about, or it went to the wrong person, or it didn't go to the panel I thought it would. So get in touch with us. Talk to us about what it is that you're doing and what you want to see, what the outcome is, and we will do our best to support you in that. But don't just guess. <laughs> because you're guess and, you know, feeling like you didn't get what you wanted out of the experience. The other thing I wanted to raise was about um, fellowship. So there's two questions on the chat, so I'm just going to answer these live and I'm going to mark them as answered live. Um, so there are two questions here about funding available for researchers with non-permanent positions such as a postdoc. So fellowships are a personal award. That means that they go with you to whichever institution you are moving to or that you are employed at. So you do not have to have a permanent contract, but you do have to be working inside the UK at the time of award. This means you could be, as one of the examples here, I think there's a, um, a researcher here who is working in a different country outside of the UK, which they don't name. If you were going to work in the UK, you could apply for a role and be offered it on the basis of, of achieving a fellowship and that's fine so you can be applying from your current institution saying oh you know i'm being sponsored by the university of bath or bristol or southampton or wherever as long as it's a uk institution and that's fine with the postdoctoral awards so there are questions about postdocs postdoctoral awards not all themes have them so again get in touch find out who does find out what we can offer you for the position that you're in and it may be that your work fits in more than one theme so for example engineering don't do postdoctoral fellowships but maths do ict don't do postdoctoral postdoctoral fellowships but physical sciences do so depending on what your work is it may be that we can help you to find a fit that will work out okay that you'll need to talk to us the other question we've got on the q a is could you explain what it means not to use positive comments to counter the negative ones yes i can tell you exactly what that looks like so when you write your PR response, you've written your proposal, you think it's amazing, everyone in your department said it's amazing, your research officer said, yeah, that's a dead cert, you've sent it off to us. Everyone's super excited, it's got, you know, it's got good scores, it's come back, and uh, all of your reviewers have raised grumpy questions about this amazing piece of work that you've written, because let's face it, everyone spends so much of their time writing these that you, you don't send them until you think they're perfect, and it's hard to hear that criticism. The immediate temptation would be to say, well, reviewer one and two agree that this process is absolutely appropriate, but reviewer three thinks that it's not very good. And I tend to agree with reviewer one and two. But what you're doing there is you're sort of saying this reviewer doesn't know what they're doing. Um, they don't know anything about this area. And uh, these two reviewers have said something different. So obviously they've got a better knowledge. That's, that's the implication. But we can see who the reviewers are and so can the chair of the panel. And quite often some of the most critical reviewers are people who you know, they've got a lot of knowledge and experience and it's okay for them to raise a question. There's like, you have to think of the PR response or, or the reviewer comments. As, so every time they, they mention something, maybe they score you a little bit lower, they give you a five because they didn't like something that you've written or they didn't understand something clearly. If you can address it properly in the PR response and say, okay, so reviewer one is concerned about this, so in this methodology I'm going to do that, or if they suggest working with someone and you're like, oh yeah, okay, I can consider that, just take it on the chin and it, just explain how you're going to fix the thing that they've raised. That's all they want you to do. And then it's not a five anymore, is it? It's a six because you, there's no problem if you see what I mean. That's not very eloquent, but I think it makes sense. That really makes sense. Um, so you have to kind of think of it as like, yeah, getting back up to a six, you have to, in order for the panel to be, because they score again at panel, you get your scores from the reviewers, and then you write your PR response and then the panel take all of that paperwork and they score based on your response to the reviewers concerns. So don't be put off by the numbers on the review forms. You know, just 
address anything that's raised and let the panel do their job. Yeah, um, I've just got a few more slides on the panel process itself, which brings us on nicely. Uh, the actual panel itself, I should say. Um, so prior to the panel, each application is given three introducers made up of the panel, um, and they will read your reviews um, and the response um, and give it a score out of 10 from several categories and an overall score. Uh, the panel are not re-reviewing your proposal. They are acting as a jury using the evidence that have, they have been given by the reviewers and your PI response. But they do read the proposals to make a decision as to whether the points have been addressed. Um, and so panels also tend to read as many of the other proposals as possible and panelists have guidance notes for scoring and are conscientious. So during the panel, any conflicted panel members will leave the room. So they might be at the same institution as the PI, or they may have a working relationship with the PI. Uh, so the first introducer will give a brief summary of the proposal, uh, their score and the justification of that score. And the second and third introducers make any additional points. And that is how we prepare a rank order list. Uh, so just to summarize, seek out critical friends. The PI response is one of your most important documents. Uh, research quality is a primary criteria and national importance is your chance to sell. And one thing to think about uh, when you are thinking about applying to EPSRC is to actually become a reviewer yourself because uh, that is a really good way to kind of see what is what makes a good or a bad proposal. Uh, so please uh, get in touch with me if you would like more information on becoming a reviewer, but it's a really, really good way of um, gaining that experience and reading other reviews. So those are my details. As I say, I don't know if we're gonna have time to answer all the questions uh, that have been posted right now. Uh, but please do send me an email or give me a call if we don't manage to cover your questions. Thank you so much, Mark and Laura. That was great. Uh, I, I was a little bit flummoxed in the middle there because you started answering questions from the Q&A and I was like, <laughs> ah, I've not got any questions left. Oh, no, no, fine. no, I've got one question that actually came in as a pre-question that's um, really good, actually, and I think it's quite interesting for a lot of people here. It seems like a lot of people have come from an interdisciplinary background so this question is, are grants skewing towards that interdisciplinary um, kind of research? And have you got any tips for people that are interdisciplinary researchers? Yeah, so the biggest tip for anyone applying for a grant that crosses research areas or research councils is to get in touch with us. The primary reason for doing that is if you cross two councils, so for example, you're doing something relating to autonomous vehicles. So you've probably got one foot in ESRC and one foot in EPSRC engineering you need to speak to us to work out which paperwork to fill in. Because you don't want to fill in all of the EPSRC forms, send it into us and then have it rejected without a remit and referred to ESRC and have to do the whole thing again. So the biggest thing here is you know, speak to us and tell us, you know, tell us what you're doing and we'll help you to find the right place. In terms of interdisciplinarity, a lot of the, so a lot of what we describe as being research areas or the way that we work is arbitrary. So go with me here. It's arbitrary in the sense that it's for us to work out how we divide our workloads within the office. So you can do a piece of research that crosses maths and engineering or, you know, um, psychology and education, you know, and it's no problem at all. And lots of research that we receive, as you'll see on GAO, if you have a look at the things that we fund, are not 100% statistics or 100%, you know, physical science. They are going to be a, a mixture of different things and they'll be coded as such, and it makes absolutely no difference. Basically, we're just deciding which head of team is going to pay how much for your grant. So it doesn't, you know, whether it fits neatly into maths or whether it's maths and ICT or whether it's, you know, ICT and something else, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is to make sure that you get it to the right person in the first place. So that there's not a delay in us working out which scheme it needs to go to, because if you just send all of the operational research, uh, research to Mark, then he has to find a home for it and make sure it gets transferred to the right person. So the internal processes for that are slow and a bit clunky. Whereas if we get it to the right person in the first place, we can process it quite quickly. 
perfect. Okay, I think I'm just going to use this time for this one last question that's popped up in the chat, which is um, um, somebody's unsure about the um, what, what national importance means. That's fine. So national importance is a bit of a strange one. And essentially, when we talk about national importance, what we're saying is if we have to justify spending this money to central government, what should we say in order to tell them that we spent these millions of pounds appropriately? That's really, that's the question because we're using taxpayers' money. So all of UKRI's taxpayers um, tax money used to fund UK research, which is why it's only UK based researchers that we fund. So when we talk about national importance, we want you to convince us that this research is important and that we can make a case to government. You can take the national importance information. So if you Google operational research EPSRC, There'll be a little blurb on there. You can steal bits out of that. That's fine. That's what it's there for. So it talks about the importance and there's published documents you can quote on there and key pieces of, of research area information that Kevin helps us to collate quite frequently. So Kevin Glazebrook, somewhere mm -hmm. around here. For operational research societies, we do work with you to, to put that together. So you can steal bits out of that or you can give us different reasons. You know, it might be emerging forms of, of AI and autonomous vehicles, things like that, that are brand new. And you think this is important. And it's important because we can't do it yet and that's okay as well but you're just telling us why you know if we have to make a choice between two areas of research at panel if they've scored exactly the same and the panel like them just as much we will use national importance as our major secondary criteria to put one proposal above the other so you need to tell us why your proposal deserves more government money or deserves government money ahead of somebody else's okay thank you that was really clear so i hope that um helped um answer that question. I'm going to leave the questions there for Mark and Laura, but again, know that we'll try and get those questions answered or you can further um, call uh, Mark or contact him um, to get anything extra answered. Okay, so thank you again, Mark and Laura, and now we're going to move on to our panel session. So Laura's going to stay um, on the screen and it, we're also going to be joined by um, our other panellists. So just so you all know, um, we've got some really interesting panellists for you here today. Um, I think we're missing just Christine and Bellen, if you can join us. There we go. Okay, so in a second, I'm going to ask our um, panellists to unmute and we'll start the session. But just before we do, just so you know, um, we are going to go through some main themes during this panel session using the questions you've sent us in before the session. But again, if you want to send us anything extra during the session, then your questions are welcome. Um, so we'll start off um, with just a little introduction from each of our panellists on uh, why they're here and why they're supporting ECRs and then we'll jump into the questions straight away. So can I first ask Maria, will you um, just give us an introduction? Hey, thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, it's so nice to see how younger people entering the world of work can be supported. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, growing the community. So the more the merrier, and it's great to see that your careers can uh, uh, grow uh, with the right amount of support. Perfect, thank you. Um, Belen, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Belen. You, uh, and I, yeah, I work in uh, the interface between data science and uh, optimization. And mainly I'm interested nowadays in interpretability in machine learning and how kind of like uh, optimization can help there. That's my main research focus. I'm glad to be here and part of this. Thanks Great. a lot for inviting me. <laughs> uh, Christine, do you want to give us a quick intro? Hello, yeah, I'm Christine from Southampton. I had some notes written to answer your question, Lucy, and then have completely lost them. Um, but I've been involved in this ECR network since it started in 2018 when I went along to Lancaster and we had a very nice time eating biscuits and having meals and everything else, which is not quite the same as we're doing this time. But, um, but yeah, and it, it's always fun just to, to meet new people and encourage people along because it's a great career, but it does take some work at the beginning to kind of get on track and realize what you're meant to do and what, what's important. So um, I think that's why, why I'm here today and to meet new people, which is always fun. Thank you. Uh, Duncan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, I'm Duncan uh, Robertson from Loughborough University. I also um, teach at uh, St Catherine's College in Oxford. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, in my main research is in agent-based modelling and simulation, but uh, I'm also interested in explaining kind of concepts to uh, people, you know, in terms of media, in terms of radio and TV, 
So, um, you know, we all have skills on uh, the analysis and I think what I'm thinking about is how we explain those quite difficult things uh, quite simply. Cool, thank you. Uh, Laura, do you want to just finish up? I know you've introduced yourself more quickly before, but... So, I'm Laura McDonnell. I formerly worked for EPSRC and now work for ESRC. So, I used to look after operational research, statistics and high probability. And now I look after data infrastructure, including UKDS. So, I've still got a bit of a, an OR leaning to my role. Great, thank you. So what I'm going to do during the session is I'm going to direct um, the questions to um, individual people and then we'll see um, if anybody else has anything to add. Um, so Laura, I've not got any to direct straight to you because of the last session that was more um, grant based. But um, if you have anything to add, please do come in on the questions because I think that some of them will be really relevant. So our main first theme is grants. So let's get cracking. Um, so my first question is, uh, what comes first, the research idea or the funding call? And I think I'm going to direct that to Belen. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I think, uh, well, it depends for in my case, being a bit of the, the, the tool, like, for example, this EPSRC first grant, I, it was more like the, the idea that I wanted to, to do and I wanted to to, and then also the, the call was like a bit in parallel. And, uh, but there are other, other things like, for example, the, the one I have with some colleagues in Innovative UK, that one was the call. So we went to, that one was led mainly by a company, but uh, actually we met the, co the people in the company in one event organized by the university. And then the three of us, the, the academic colleagues, we got together, went to Innovate UK list of uh, funding calls and found one that could, you know, we had some ideas where we got, could apply our research to help this company. And then we talked to the company and it was like, like that. So it was really like mm, the idea and then looking for something that fit that idea. But yeah, it's a bit of uh, in it's uh, uh, a bit of in, in, inter uh, yeah like a situation <laughs> a bit of one and a bit of the other every time. Yeah, I can understand. I can understand that. Does anyone else have anything to add to that as well from their experience? Yeah, Duncan. Um, just to say, uh, it's kind of impossible to know all the sources of funding out there, and that's why you know coming to events like this is great. You know, Laura's um, put down some links, but um, if you are lucky enough to be in a university which has research development managers get to know them talk to them because they're the people who are completely know what's going on and the search costs are quite huge to know everything so uh, make friends with your research development manager i think this question actually links very well to the question that's just come up in the q a and um, which is about um including um kind of collaboration with industry partners in research um, so actually this might be best answered by Laura. So what are grant funders looking for in collaborations when they involve industrial partners? Okay, so firstly, I want to just make it abundantly clear that we don't mind if research is entirely blue skies and has no application at all, or if it is something that is very applied and has very clear industry links and benefits to other sectors. So we're happy either way. There's, there's no panel preference. So just to reassure anybody that we're worried. And that's the same for pretty much all research funders in the UK. We are happy to fund it either way. When we are looking at industrial collaborations, what we want to see ideally is sense that, so when you approach an industry partner to work with them, if they're going to be a project partner on your grant, they should offer you some kind of leverage. So that should either be financial support or it should be some kind of in-kind support. So it might be that you work with their research team or they can offer you use of their labs or they've got something that they can, they can give to you. Please be super aware that when you submit your project partner letter of support, so this is just, an, it's a holdup that slows people through the grant process. You do need to detail what the, the guesstimate cost of that is going to be. So how much money. So if they're lending you their lab for three days, what do they think that would actually cost? If they're lending you space in their, in their department to work with their researchers, what do they estimate the cost of that to be? And it will be a complete guess and it's absolutely fine if it bears no relation to any time they've ever done it before. But we have to collect that information for the government so uh, we will not be able to process your grant without it okay. so for your project partners you need to be able to demonstrate that obviously what you're doing is really really relevant to them so you can put that into your national importance and you can talk about um, strengthening the links between research and the UK economy you need to be able to justify how you're going to work together so to be a project partner there has to be some two-way 
process. You know, you have to work with them. They have to they have to offer you something in order to demonstrate their enthusiasm for your project. And that thirdly, we would expect them to write a letter that tells us why they want to work with you. So make sure that you have that. So not just that I'm going to work with this company and it's going to cost, they're going to give me this much money. We want to see some kind of enthusiasm that, that, that we can take to panel and the panelists can, can appreciate. But yeah, we do like to see um, companies working with researchers. It's, you know, it's really, really good for the work we're doing around the UK economy, but obviously it's not an expectation of EPSRC or any other UKRI research funding. Great, thank you. That's great. Um, okay, so my, the second question coming just from the um, three questions that we got sent in was, how do you prioritise and focus on which grants to apply for? So, Christine, do you want to comment on that? Um, I may be the worst person to comment on this because I have no idea really how you prioritise on, on what it is. I mean, if it's a certain amount of time and what you have going on at the moment, and whether you can feasibly submit a grant application for the deadline, if it's one with the deadline. Um, but I think like Laura said and Mark said, talking to people and working out whether what you are doing actually fits with the criteria of the grant before you spend a lot of time putting all the work together is really important. Um, because otherwise you could, yeah, you could waste yourself a lot of time putting something together and then just get a two line answer back saying this doesn't fit the criteria, which is really upsetting at that point. So I think, I think that's the main way to prioritise. I think that's something I've definitely taken away. I didn't actually realise how, um, you know, how much you encourage people to um, come to uh, you as grant um, kind of providers and funding bodies to ask so how much support you can give. So that's really good to know. So, yeah, I think that's great advice. Thank you, Christine. We can't tell you if something's going to be successful, but we can tell you if something's a fit. So we can tell you if the idea is in the right place, if it's at the right time. But for in terms of research for us, we would say think about whether it's something that you're doing for you, which would be a fellowship, a personal award for your own development, or think about whether it's something that's a big piece of research that's going to need a team, because that's going to be a standard grant, or if it's just PDRA, it's going to be a new investigative award. So before you start, you know, delving through calls and seeing what you think takes your fancy, think about what it is you want to actually do, because if you've got no plans to manage a team, then a fellowship might be the right call, or if you want to buy out a certain amount of your time, you know, there are restrictions based on what you choose. Great, cool. Okay, so the last question on grants that we've had come in so far, or actually there's one just coming quickly, but one second. Um, so how do you make a success from a rejected proposal? So Duncan, do you want to start us off on that one? Um, uh, I'm not sure why you chose me about the rejected proposal, but... <laughs> I knew who I chose for um, that. I go, well, I think, I think, you know, all these things are um, very useful. So the, just the process of going through a, um, uh, getting a proposal together, is very useful in terms of getting to know colleagues, getting to know the process. Um, and I think, you know, it's a way of, you know, someone, I think the previous speaker talked about time to actually think about something. So, you know, it can be a time to think about something you're not actually doing at the moment and to think about, you know, planning a, a kind of set of papers that come from a, um, a submission, regardless of whether it's funded. So, um, take it out of it what you can and don't, you know, it's it's not wasted time. Always. <laughs> sounds good. Does anyone else have anything to add on that? Yeah, Christine? I just wanted to say it, it does hit you very hard when you get a rejected proposal and there's no underestimating the fact that it hurts when someone rejects your proposal and particularly when you've got, if you've had, say, really good reviews and it's gone to panel and then it doesn't get doesn't get funded it's, it's a bit of a kick in the teeth and so don't don't it, it's a kick in the teeth for everybody it's not just you I always describe myself as um, an expert in getting funding proposals rejected because <laughs> you have to put in quite a lot to be able to get some successful ones I mean EPSLC won't necessarily want to hear this I mean you don't blast them with proposals they don't want that you're only putting good ones in but it is a bit of a lottery to a certain extent when it comes through. You kind of, you can get one that goes above the standard that it's fundable and it can be, but you can just hit a panel where there's some amazing proposals there and yours just happens to slip below. And it's no reflection on you as a person or anything else. It's just you were unlucky on the day and somehow yours didn't make it into that top three. So don't see it as a personal affront if it gets doesn't get funded, but it will hurt nonetheless. 
think um, both Maria and Laura want to say something, so we'll go to Maria first. And Mine is actually a very boring comment, but if you're really at the beginning of your career, there is a lot of due diligence that has to be done when you submit a grant proposal. So your best friends are the research office, the finance office, and make sure that you do all your ethics approval or your due diligence uh, approval, all the paperwork with other institutions or other companies. So start and give yourself a lot of time and possibly a mentor to review the process because the first time around, I just thought I write my proposal, I submit it and that's it. Um, no, there is a lot to be done in terms of submitting your grant and having all the paperwork in place. So you need a mentor in your institution that probably follows with you all the steps at the very first time. Okay, that's a good point. Um, Laura, did you want to say something? I just wanted to, to sort of reiterate that funding is extremely competitive and it doesn't matter which funder you, you go through, they are all very, very competitive. So it's not specific to EPSRC, but I know that, that disproportionately affects this community. I mean, our success rates, if I'm being brutally frank with you, are somewhere around a third. And, you know, whilst that might sound like an awful lot of things that we fund, I mean, that's also still two thirds of things that don't get funded. And that doesn't mean that they weren't excellent or, you know, extremely good or very well reviewed. It just means that unfortunately, after much deliberation and heartache, the panel scored them slightly lower than, than the top part of the, the score sheet. You know, very often, if we could, we could fund everything that went to panel. It's all highly scored. It's all well reviewed. You know, the panel all think it's excellent, but actually, you know, we don't have that kind of money. So it's just you know, bad luck. It's not about you doing something awful or getting it all wrong. You know, it's just really, really bad luck on the day. It's actually good to know that, um, you know, it's not people that go in, in, you know, first time that are the ones that are just getting rejected. It's people that have been experienced in this field for ages and ages that still actually experience that so I know it's not a nice thing but it's actually kind of um, you know you know it's it's just a hard process so that's good to know. Um, I think if people actually put down like on their CV and things the things they've been rejected from it make their CVs really really long so yeah. Okay so we're going to move slant a little bit now um, and go on to publishing and I think um, I really like this question that came from um, somebody from before the session. Um, how do you actually balance the prestige of big journals against the specialism of smaller journals? And do you think it makes a difference on how your research is perceived, which one you go for? So um, can we go start with Maria on that one? Yeah, it's a difficult one to answer. I'll just mention one of my mentors for that because he always told me, you need to find the right balance between quantity and quality. Um, so I think when you're looking for a good position, especially in a good institution, you might need some of those top journals in your resume. So always try to have one project running that you are aiming to submit to the top journal. But you also might have a project you are incredibly passionate about and might go to a lower tier journal. And I think you see, she will still uh, work on it uh, and try to submit it to the suitable uh, place. So if you have the luxury, try to find a mix that allows you to build your resume in the right direction, but also do what you're passionate about. Great. Does anyone else have anything, any experience with that? that you want to add? No? Oh, do you want to go to Kunya? Um, yeah, just, just I think the, the worst thing to do is to um, not get it published anywhere. So um, I think we've probably all got, uh, you know, documents open that we could find of, of things that we haven't ha found a home for. And, and, you know, it's part of that thing about, you know, you may submit to a very high profile journal and get um, uh, rejected and then get very, very sad for the next couple of years, which time, you know, this, this good piece of work potentially is sitting there, um, not being published. So, you know, get rid of it as, as um, yeah, either improve it or get rid of it. Don't uh, not publish it, he says. <laughs> no, it's great. No, great advice. Um, so one other thing, do you have any um, top tips for publishing in those top respected journals? So Belen, do you want to have a comment on that? Yeah, sorry, can you repeat because I was like still like with it. <laughs> no worries. Um, so do you have any tips for publishing in the top rated journals? Um, yeah, so just what, what I have uh, in my mind also for the, for the previous um, uh, thing. For me, it's like if you remember what what I, I've talked about this kind of idea of having like the big goal challenge or the big thing, looking at the big picture and looking at how your contribution, although it's very specialist on that area, how it will affect and will contribute to the big 
cancer. So if you have an improvement, for example, for a genetic algorithm, try to think about how it will uh, apply also the same idea or a similar one to other uh, metaheuristic ones. It has not been applied before, for example. And this helps you to go to the top journal. And if you don't get it, then it's not just a reject. It's just you know that it's going to have its home in its specialist journal. I don't work in genetic algorithms, but I work in other metaheuristic. So, um, um, for me, it's like the way I see the thing. It's like many of the ideas that can be shared. Uh, and, and also, it's like, uh, what is the big question that you are trying to answer? And when, once this is clear, uh, then it's, uh, you can go for the top journal. You have much better chances, and still you're doing something that is worth publishing in the, in, in, in the more specialized journal. So you are covering like both at the same time. That's my, my advice. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything to add on that one? Uh, Maria, was that? Um, I think it's a mix of contributions and you need to have quite a, a few strong points in some of these. Uh, you need to have a sexy problem to solve. Uh, it has to be applied, it has to be new, it has to be relevant, uh, so it has to sell the problem you're solving, or it has to be so well known that everyone is working on that. Uh, you need to have some uh, methodological contributions, so it doesn't have to be straightforward application of textbook algorithms, maybe. Uh, and I think you also need to avoid rookie mistakes. So you need to send a paper that is well written, there are no typos, the notation is spot on, uh, or these are the first things that when you submit to a top journal, they immediately go, no, this is not our sort of thing. Uh, finally, I will also say you can be careful about the papers you are referencing. Sometimes having the right references show that it's a problem of a certain relevance, that important people have studied it, so it already elevates the status of your manuscript, if anything. That was great, thank you. Um, okay, so I think we're going to move on again, and I'm just going to, because some of the questions are coming in um, into the chat on this, I think we'll go to um, kind of applying for uh, different positions right at this moment. So um, quite a few of the questions, the first three that have come into the chat here are about how how would you go about finding a, a good position, whether that's for a postdoc or as an assistant professor? Um, Christine, do you want to have a comment on that? Um, yeah, I think it's tricky. Um, yeah, talking to someone who, who's been at Southampton for years, so I haven't had this problem for a while. But um, I think you have to think about what your priorities are. Have you got a partner who also needs a job? Who needs to come along with you so that might restrict where you go geographically um and that's an important important thought do you want to actually live in the place so i'm going for all the non-work things first so that can cut you down to a few different places but then if you're looking at if all that's equal you've found places that you would want to go i think for a postdoc you're looking for an interesting position with a big big name if possible because who's doing something different from what you've done previously. And I think it's good to get that change of change in experience to see a different place um, and get see a different way of working from the one that you've experienced during your PhD. So I think that's quite, quite nice. Um, sometimes it's not feasible. I, I stayed in the same place after my PhD, partly because I had a partner who had a very nice job down here. So I didn't really, we couldn't as a couple move very easily. Um, and, and it still works, but I think you then have to make more of an effort to work with other people and, and get that broader, broader picture rather than continuing to publish with your um, PhD supervisor, which is something people do look at a bit later on, is to, they want to check that you have some research independence, so that's quite important. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I think it's, it's quite a personal thing where you end up working, I think you need to like the place and like the people um as much as possible so yeah just a second point oh i'm um, actually i'll let maria come in on that one before i move on so what did you like sure. to say uh, if there are some international students and they're interested in a career in the uk all postdocs and uh, official positions are on jobs at uk uh, so there is UK is relatively easy. You can find all the positions advertised. Uh, obviously, then try to get in touch and get some more information. Um, but then it really depends on the country you're looking for. 
and given the strange times, you might need to be very open to consider many alternative places. And uh, uh, yes, try also to get in touch and get in, gather as much information as possible about the possible place you might end up. Just don't fill as many random applications as you can. Yeah, that's one of our attendees has actually asked um, that, um, would you suggest writing directly to professors about a position? Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, mm -hmm. if there is a position advertised, uh, usually there is also a reference of the person you can get in touch with. Um, there is also word of mouth, so especially your supervisor may recommend you to other colleagues. Uh, and if they have a position, they are probably more likely to get in touch with you first. Um, I think, Belen, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, something very, very quick is like, uh, don't get encouraged when you are looking for a job that you didn't get something somewhere. Um, look more about the feed, because I remember when I was looking for a position that came from Spain to here, I, I had no, I, I, I was not successful in universities that were I mean, lower rank than University of Edinburgh when I got there. The, but then when I came here, I understood it because it was a very, very good fit. And uh, and yeah, and maybe even in the other one, my CV was a bit like uh, Spanish or whatever. So basically, it's, sometimes the fit is very important. Some place where you feel like you can, so sometimes they are looking for someone that is complementary to what they have. Sometimes it's kind of like, uh, it, it fits because it's the same topic. Some others like a mix of two different topics. So it depends, but the fit is very important. So don't get encouraged, keep on going, even for the good universities. That's a good point. Um, Mario, someone just asked if you could add um, the website you mentioned. Oh, you've already done that, so that's perfect. Uh, let me, I don't know if I can type here directly, but I'll do it on the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, Right, okay, so I think we'll actually move on from that one. So we've got a little bit more time um, for the um, other topics. So and we're now going to talk about a little bit on organisation slash balancing your work. Um, so the first question is, do you have any practical advice on how to strike a balance between developing your teaching skills um, and pursuing research objectives? Um, Duncan, would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, so I think... Uh, certainly in the early stage of a career, I think um, it's about getting experience of teaching. Um, and then, you know, I, I think probably most of us, when we were starting our careers, put a lot of effort into our first set of PDFs uh, or sort of slides. Um, and I think um, then hopefully some of the teaching you do can be linked back to the research you do. And it becomes kind of a lot easier and you know generally more interesting you're not necessarily teaching other people's stuff but you're kind of relating it to what you do and bringing examples from what you do so hopefully you can use your research to make your teaching more interesting you mean like using um like case studies to kind of um hammer points home in class or something like that um or just the the problem that you're interested in i mean you know if you can apply your uh, research to to the teaching you're doing then it generally makes it much easier to teach because you're not boring yourself whilst doing the lecture, right? <laughs> hey, Mario, do you want to add to that? If I can share my main mistake when I started as a lecturer is that I re-engineered my units and that's normal, it will take you a lot of time. But I didn't think of a way to re-engineer them in a way that they were smooth to run. So yes, make them challenging, make them interesting, but also make sure that in the years to come, you can put less of an effort, but still provide a great student's experience. So think about how the assessment is going to go, how long it's going to take to mark you that piece of work, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Christine, do you want to say something? Yeah, just following up what Maria said on them um, teaching, I remember being told by my first boss to um, run, run with the lecture course for the first year and don't make too many changes because there's often a reason why things are done in the order that they're done or the way that they've been done and then make the changes the second year instead, which I think like Maria, I probably ignored completely. <laughs> Tried to rewrite everything and do everything all at the same time, just as I was starting a new job. Um, but yeah, I think looking back now, if I take on a new lecture course, I will try and just follow their stuff as much as I can for the first term, first time I run it through and then change it all the next year. So. 
Yeah, I don't think I've actually learned more about a topic than when I've had to teach it because you've just got to be so on top of it. Um, yeah, I got really scared when I first looked at my first course I ever taught because I was like, oh gosh, how can I explain this to someone? I know this, but yeah, it's hard. Do you want to say something, Bella? Yeah, I want to echo, well, I, I want to, I completely agree with the, the thing that they, they said, but also I want to add that now, now we all are living in a, in a moment where we, we need to change and revolutionize somehow our teaching again. <laughs> so, but still like, I think it's a good idea what Maria said, that you keep in mind that maybe this year is going to be more difficult, but keep in mind that you want it to be easier and easier in the future. For example, in the kind of like, um, it was in a bit of a fight with the IT team in my, in my university. They want us to use an online tool that is very kind of simple to record the videos. And, uh, and, and then it's like, they, when they, they send me another alternative, it was like, no, but this is very difficult to kind of like learn to use that. But I thought, you know, it's, I'm gonna use that because maybe for the future, this is gonna be more useful. For example, if I can edit the videos myself, maybe I can use the parts that I've done well this year or when well the students liked uh, and then like put pieces of other videos that are new to kind of like, so, so try to think now on how you're gonna, use in the future what you are the, the effort that you're putting now and then in general also the, the thing about the step the daily steps there makes more changes because like in research is very different than teaching in research we want to be innovative we want to try new things we want to but teaching you have the students right there and if uh, you try something that goes wrong, those students, they're going to be unhappy and you are going to feel horrible. And this is going to affect your everything. So, so it's not really good. <laughs> it's not the, the place where you want to be innovative. You, want, you can be innovative, but try to do it in step by step. So, you know, that the, the, the innovation that you do this year, you have a backup plan, from, which is the same thing that you have experience with. And you also can reduce all the things and experience that you have in teaching. Yeah, that's really good. Really, really good advice there. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm now going to ask uh, another question from that came in before the session. Um, how many research students do you think it might be sensible to work with at a time? I think we're all encouraged to work with research students now. So how do you balance how many take on against things that you need to do yourselves? Uh, so, uh, Christine, do you want to come up with that? Um, yeah, I mean, it varies a little bit from student to student and what stage they're at. I like to have at least one in each of the three years, so at least one first year, second year and third year. But sometimes it bunches and you end up with two in one year and um, none in another. Sorry, my son's just got home from school, so it might get noisy here. Um, uh, so, yes, we... But I have had occasions where I've had too many and it, it's not good for you personally and it's not good for the students. So I think it's um, kind of, it's a tricky balance because if you've got a good, three good ones who come along at once, you want to take all of them, but equally it's not fair to, to have too many. So I'm not answering the question well. I, it, it, I don't really know the, the right number. Some people seem to manage with, you know, 10 students and I don't know how they do it. So. I think it varies from person to person and, and also how much support you give them. I like to talk to them quite a lot. Um, that limits how many you can have. Does anyone else want to comment on that as well? Uh, Duncan? Um, I think it, it also depends on your uh, institution where you are in terms of the norms, in terms of how many are expected. I think the one thing I would say is that, um, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the answer to the question is it depends on the research students. So some research students are great. You can just, you know, you want to be with them. You want to have that sort of call, you know, that time spent with them. Um, I think I'd be very wary, certainly as an early career researcher, of taking on a student who is going to cause you problems. Um, and... Um, and, and just, you know, be, be uh, if you can be, be a little bit discerning about who you take on as a research student, especially at the beginning, because um, they can turn from great assets into liabilities. So. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I think I'm too close to having been a <laughs> Oh, my gosh, was I a liability? Yes, I probably was. <laughs> okay, great. That's great. Um, I think we're going to move on to uh, collaboration uh, now as a the theme. Um, so... Uh, 
this is yeah this is a really really interesting um question that probably goes to Laura as well as um our other panelists so um, how do you develop projects with a, an industrial partner as a first thing and then what funding opportunities are there for this? So um, do you want to, should, should we start off with Laura? So yeah, that would be great, Laura, if you can comment on that. So I'm sure that my colleagues um, who are also on the panel are going to talk more about the process of developing um, your projects, but I just wanted to make you just very clearly say that any of the standard application processes can be used for industrial collaboration. So you can do an investigator role with an industrial collaborator, you can do a fellowship with an industrial collaborator, you can do a standard application or a travel grant or anything else that you need, and we will happily support that. So you can use any of our mechanisms for funding to work with industrial partners, including actually the um, UKRI calls as well. So, All right. Yeah, so you're not limited. I mean, basically, you just need to think about what it is that you want to do and then work out which of those is the best fit. So I will hand over to everybody else to work out how you develop those ideas in the first place. Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll start off with um, Maria for um, how do you start to develop those kind of um, relationships with industrial partners and then make them into projects? It's a difficult one for me because um, I think unless the company has been uh, working for a long time with universities and is aware of the advantages that can come, it's often very hard to convince them that uh, work can make a difference. So it's usually a long-term work and the company should have some sort of awareness about what the work is. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, moving around and going and speaking and trying to establish these relationships step by step. One way, for example, here is when you have a good class of MBA students, you try to bring what you're teaching into practice and make them aware that uh, uh, you could be helpful for their work. Uh, but yeah, it's a difficult one. I pro I'm very curious to hear what the others have to say because it's, uh, unless the company is very aware, I found it often a hard sell. Okay, has anyone else got a good experience, Belen? Do you want to hear? Okay. Well, I don't have uh, much experience, but I stood that in the last year, it's kind of like blooming the experience. Well, I had, pre uh, there's a bit of a, this serendipity, I would say. For example, the Innovate UK grant where I participated, um, that was from an AIM day, something that, an event that my university organized and and but there being other events of the same kind with many many companies and nothing came up out of that and there we were very happy uh, we were very lucky uh, that we were very um, that uh, there was a person there who was really looking for some you know people in in in, in university to collaborate with and was very open so this was the one where we looked we went to the innovate uk and looked for what grant we wanted to to apply for and indeed, we then, lead, although it was Innovate UK and was supposed to be led by them, they led the grant and they led the project, but the, the initiative was a lot from us, and the ideas and, and a lot. Uh, but, the, yeah, but, but then uh, recently, since I got this EPSRC grant, I, I, won, I, I had, I, I, for many years since I, I arrived to Edinburgh, some of my colleagues, they had contact with a banking. And I started to attend the, the, the meetings and then also uh, the credit research uh, conference. And there I learned about what are the challenges this industry is facing. And then I applied for the EPSRC grant and I, at that moment I didn't really have the contact because banking industry is really like hard <laughs> to get into. <laughs> at least this is my experience. And, uh, but the point is that since the, the last year, because the problem was so important and kind of like this interpretability machine learning, like when I applied for the grant, it was like, I could see it was important, but no one was talking about that. And now everyone is talking about, about that. The opportunities are coming. And I'm feeling it still not from big banks, but from, uh, 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 from fintechs or startups and small companies. That, uh, it's very interesting. And they are also a, a key role is the role of the business development people that you have in the university. They, are, they, they, help, they, they have helped a lot in, 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 this, uh, in the whole process because even talking to them is kind of like difficult if you do it 
as a researcher in you know by yourself you need these people to to know to understand what to say to to help you in in your way and also with the grants also it does sound like support out there for um, us as ecrs from like within university and out, you know funding bodies that we i just hadn't known about before this so um, I think, Duncan, did you have something to add and then we'll go to Christine? Uh, yeah, um, it's just interesting reading the comments that um, Joshua has um, put a, uh, a comment in about Innovate UK. Um, so I, I have no experience with them, but it's, it's, it's a similar thing about finding a, a, a grant. You know, if you don't know who's searching for, you know, uh, academic partners, you don't know, um, you won't be able to find them. So speak to your business development managers. Um, and also, if you want a sort of low risk way of doing uh, industrial collaborations, you might want to think about an MSc project. So if you have MSc students, you know, spend three months on a trial run. And if nothing else, you get to know the people who you would be working with uh, before committing to a period of time. That's very good. Uh, Christine, did you want to come in and then we'll go to Laura? Yeah, this is just a quick one. I think as an ECR, you're quite dependent on what links your department has already with with businesses. So a lot of the research projects we have that get taken into research projects are with partners that the university's been working with for quite a number of years. So talking to colleagues and finding out what's going on, as Duncan says, supervising MSc projects or being involved in PhD projects that involve the partner are all quite useful ways of kind of getting to know people. But there's an awful lot of talking to people and kind of handshaking and being nice to them and remembering what they do and this kind of public facing networking type work that's quite important with keeping everybody happy and, and um, keeping these relationships going which is not to be underestimated it takes some time but it is quite enjoyable but it does take time and um, but it is very useful as well thank you um laura did you want to put some say something there super quickly in relation to innovate so innovate um, work with projects that are much higher up the TRL scale than um, the other councils do. So you have to think of the councils as kind of a trifle. So if you're submitting work to EPSRC, the work you're going to be doing with industry is probably a lot more tentative or um, future focused than um, the kind of work that would go to innovate. So again, it's worth getting in touch and speaking to them before you fill in all of those forms and then have them return to you because you're at the wrong point. So very, very good shout from Joshua. But just a quick heads up that each council has its own way of working and they support people at different layers at different points of their, their research so EPSRC is super fundamental and underpins everything else and you've got all your BDSRC, NERC, ESRC etc and then innovate was on the top like the, the creamy stuff and sprinkles so you know they're great to get involved with and they do loads of networking events which would be worth attending but yeah just be mindful that if you're putting something in because you're doing industrial collaboration it doesn't always mean they're the right place so maybe we can find out something about Innovate UK or those networking events and maybe we can put that in the LinkedIn group for you guys so um, you know about that for future as well. Um, so uh, just a second question on collaboration then, and this isn't necessarily about industry, this could be about um, you know, working with other academics within or outside of your university. Um, how do you sustain relationships with collaborators? Uh, Duncan, do you want to comment on that one? Um, well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's rather like sometimes, uh, you know, the strength of weak ties, sometimes you'll have very strong relationships with collaborators and then you may spend years not talking to them, not because you've fallen out, just because you don't have anything kind of research active in common. Uh, but then you may pick up the phone, you know, a few years later. So it's almost like keeping connections that you might think about later. So you don't necessarily have to sustain the same people as, as active collaborators but you know oh and the other thing is just be nice to people I think um, <laughs> you know the thing is that uh, you can lose your own reputation very uh, very easily by being nasty to people um, and generally it is a small world so it'll come back to bite you. I think that's a good message for this whole situation everybody should be nice to each other whilst in lockdown and beyond. <laughs> um, does anyone else have anything else to add to that on like sustaining relationships no okay cool well i think uh, actually we've only got um five minutes left so i think i'll just try and oh there is one question in the answer feed so somebody's actually put um is offering your almost ready research to a professor a good way to find a position 
Um, Christine, do you want to comment on that? Um, I assume this is in reference to applying for a job. Yes. Um, yeah, if you get cold called by somebody who tells you what their research is and asks if there's a position available at your university, generally there isn't. I mean, you might keep them in mind um, and you'll put them on the back, you'll kind of maybe store them in a folder and intend to get in touch with them if something relevant comes up. Not everyone remembers to do that, even if they even if they were really good, the position comes up six months later and that email's long gone. So it's it's better to keep you keep your eyes open. Sometimes you can get lucky and there is something there. And sometimes, you know, if you've done particularly well and you kind of know that professor already, it's useful for them to know you're looking for something and then maybe they can say, Well, you know, there's these fellowships you can apply for or I'm I'd love to work with you, I'll put in the research grant and maybe you can be named on it. Um, but they're probably rarer than the cold calls you get to say, can I work with you, which tend not to be so useful, I think. Mm -hmm. um, is that a comment? Do you want to say something, Maria? I, I might have misunderstood the question because I couldn't understand if they mean if it's a good way to give ready research to become a professor like you do the research and you put the name of the professor on your publication, if that was the question actually. I thought, I think that might have been the question, but I wasn't 100% sure because I don't think you should be giving away your research because it's yours. Yes, so. uh, we receive, a, I receive personally a few of these requests from time to time, like I've done this research, do you want to sign it or do you want to be a co-author? And I don't think you want to be in a research environment in which colleagues put their name without doing the work and being really an active part of the research project. Uh, so my recommendation is no. I think it's fair to write emails to more senior colleagues and ask to be part of a research project with you. Uh, but your research is your research and no one should sign for the sake of signing. And I don't think they will ever give you a position because you just gave them away a publication. Okay, I think that's a yeah, fair comment. Um, and just as a nice thing, um, somebody's just asked this as a question and I quite like it. So let's end the question with a statement from all of you um, just on what you wish you'd known when you back began your ECR career. Um, so we'll come around in turn. So Belen, do you want to start us off? If you knew one thing at the start of your career, what would, you, what would it have been? One thing that I, sorry. So if you could have known something like in high, you know, in hindsight, what would you, what would you know? Um, what would you take from your experience you have um, if you'd have started your ECR career and, and known that? Yeah, for me, the, the most important thing is to think about what are your, really think about what are your strengths and, and try to move towards more leadership. Because uh, I remember for a long time, I was still working with my supervisors or, and, and I felt a kind of like a pressure to kind of like work a lot, find time where I didn't have. And the, my strengths were not really like valuable there. They valued it before, but then later on, it's like I had much more responsibilities because I had a lot of teaching at the time I was, some of that time I was in Spain working and the, the load there is very, very heavy. And so you have much more, so you have less time for doing the thing. And my ideas were all, all the time in my mind, like wanting to kind of like do different things. Uh, and and I, there was no need for that because I didn't, I was in a different university, then I moved to the UK. And then it's like this thing about going and as they try to get grant. So you, you really get some of your time or some time from other, some resources to hire people. So move in the ladder. Think about how you're gonna move, not in sense of in the sense of promotion or, or money and title, but on, on the you know, on really how you're gonna become from being the person who has to who does the things to the person who leads. And this is a, a it's been a change in my career. And I think it's very important that you start learning how you can lead from early on. Maria, shall we Thank you for that, Ellen. That's good. I think I was missing. Uh, I, when I started this career, I was also thinking, oh, I need to finish this PhD. Oh, I need to find this job. But actually, the career is like 40, 45 years. 
And uh, every decision we make will set the foundations for a very long time. Uh, for example, setting up a positive relationship with people in the community, with co-authors, uh, with colleagues, uh, um, trying to be in a positive environment and also accept the ups and downs because there is going to be a lot of downs and there are going to be a lot of times in your career in which you will have to slow down. Um, so the idea of thinking of the career as a long path and not just the next thing to do and to be just anxious about it, but try to enjoy the ride and think of it as a long-term uh, lifetime experience, if anything. Sorry, I keep having to keep myself because my cat is going crazy outside this door. Um, so, um, can we come to you next, Duncan? Um, yeah, I think uh, I would have liked to have known what the academic game is. Um, I still don't know what the academic game is, but um, a good way of knowing is to perhaps have a mentor and for them to talk you through what you should be doing. Because we talk about grants and teaching and research. That may depend in, in terms of which institution you're in. So, and it may be that you fit better elsewhere. So there's a lot of discussion in the US about tier one universities, which, you know, do you really want to be there? Um, sometimes you may be more focused on a teaching institution or a research or, you know, etc. So uh, think about the, the environment you want to be in and whether you fit that environment. Thank you. That was great. Um, good points as well. Um, Christine, do you want to finish us off with the, what, what you wish you knew? Well, I think most people have said what I wish I knew already, so I don't have much to say. Um, when I first started, my um, boss and my mentor was close to retirement and he had quite, he was lovely, but he had quite old fashioned ideas about what was important. So he told me not to apply for any grants because they were too, too much of a too much of a problem. You don't need grants. You just need to work on your own, which at the time was actually not the not the, the right decision. So I think if I wish I'd talked to more people and um, and got a wider perspective on what was going on. So mentors are great, but you need just in case that one mentor's got their own opinion, you need need some other people as well. So so yeah, yeah, talking to people. I talking to people is something I don't struggle with. So um, I, I got there in the end. But. No, I think that's all good comments. Thank you very much um, from all of you for taking part in the panel. Like it's, um, it's been really good. Um, I had a chance to look at these questions before they came in and I could see um, from everybody sending in questions that they were really um, things I've not even thought of. And some of the answers you've said are things I've not even, um, even heard of. So um, that was really great. Um, I know it's been useful for me, so I hope it's been useful for everyone in the audience as well. Um, okay, so at this point, I think um, we'll finish off the panel session and I just wanted to say, um, so thank you for all of our speakers and um, thank you, special thanks to Carol and Eve, who you can't see, uh, that have been here organising everything, and Mark that you can't see as well, because he's, um, you know, just out of, out of, out of shot. Um, and everyone for actually uh, coming and attending today's event. And special thanks again to our sponsors in Venia Labs. Um, Joshua has been uh, putting some really interesting comments in the questions and in the um, in the chat. So thank you for doing that, Joshua. It's brought up some new things into the into the session, and um, we hope that you've enjoyed it and that you'd want to come to something like this again. So don't forget to fill out the survey um, to tell us what you liked or disliked about this event and what we can do for next time that would be helpful to you as ECRs. Um, I have had a special request to go and get my cat, so I'm going to go and get my cat. <laughs> Uh, come on, Mum. Come on, Monkey. Anyone wants to say hi to me? So, there she is for everybody. Wriggle pot. <laughs> oh, she wants to stay. So, I think um, <laughs> at that point, I'm glad that's why I didn't have her in here for the session. At that point, we'll uh, we'll uh, end today's session and um, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.